Come gather around the table where we collect crumbs of truth from God's Word. Today I would like to talk about your Bible, namely the King James Version of the Bible. I'm not here to put down the other versions of the Bible, but just to talk about the beauty in the King James Version. I collect many, many Bibles. In fact, I've got most of them pictured here, and you can see that I have various versions as well. I have New King James, NIV, uh, the New Living Translation. I have most every translation. What I don't have here, I do have on an app. Every one of them has a value to me. It's kind of interesting. A uh, couple of months ago, I lost my mother. Uh, she went home to be with the Lord, and my father and my sister have been going through storage units and some of her stuff and looking at uh, old memories and organizing stuff and getting things ready. And they found my very first copy of the Bible when I was just a baby. Here we have the New Testament with Psalms. It was given to me in April of 1972. And what's even more interesting is my wife's father found her first edition of the Bible back from 1982. She had the deluxe model since it had Proverbs 2. Anyway, this is, a, I guess, where my collection of Bibles stem from. Some people would ask me, Dave, what is the difference between the different versions of the Bible? It comes down to texts and manuscripts. <clears throat> There's two sets of manuscripts out there, two sets of texts, if you will. The first one is called the traditional text, and this is where we get the King James, the New King James, the modern uh, English version, as well as the old stuff like the G Geneva, the Bishop's Bible, the Tyndale. All those were translated from the traditional text. That traditional text consists of the Masoretic text and what people would call the Texas Receptus for the New Testament. Then we have a, a critical text, and this critical text came to us in the late 1800s, and it was a different compilation of manuscripts, and it would be the Masoretic text, but the critical form, and then for the New Testament, they used the Westcott Hort New Testament. Now, I'm not out here to beat anybody up over which manuscripts they use, but I just wanted to point out something that I enjoy about the King James Version. I have many people many friends who use other versions, and that's something that I don't want to get in the way of our friendship. It's not worth it. The biggest question I get asked when I go to camp is, Dave, what translation of the Bible should I use? And I've thought about this a lot, and a friend of mine is a director of this camp, and what he likes to say is, the one you will read. And I agree with that assessment. It doesn't matter which version of the Bible you're reading, when you seek God, you will find God. When you seek salvation, you will find salvation. I would rather you read any version of the Bible than not read the Bible at all. The only caveat would be if you get into the Jehovah's Witness or the Book of Mormon or something that's not the Bible, that's written as a companion to the Bible, is not God's Word. Those are things I wouldn't want you to be involved in. Only the, the Bible. I prefer to use the, new, the King James, the New King James, and the modern English version because they're based off of the traditional texts. I actually like the King James, the King James the best because of its beautiful wording. One of the other things I get asked a lot at camp is what is the difference between reading the Bible and studying the Bible? Dave, do I really need the King James version just to read the Bible? The difference between reading and studying comes down to speed at which you are pulling that information in. If you're just wanting to get through a reading plan, let's say you have the ambition to read the whole Bible in three months, and there's a plan out there for you to do that. There's another plan out there to do it in six months or a year, and you're just trying to plug through that and get through that reading. That's reading the Bible. And you can use any translation for that. You can use the King James. You could use the, the New King James. You could use any of those translations. But if you're going to study the Bible, then you have to understand that words matter. Words make a difference on what the meaning of something is. I have to use the appropriate word to describe the situation I'm in. If I can't find the appropriate word, 
I have to use the appropriate phrase that reflects what that word means. But Dave, there are so many archaic and old words in the King James Version, and I don't understand those. And I say, you are correct. Our English today is far less than what the English was back in the 1600s. There are many, many, many more words that they had available than we have now. Therefore, when they translated the King James, they had words to describe each situation. The other thing I get is, well, there's so many these and thous, and, and it's just a confusing mess. I said, the reason that those are in there is not because they spoke that way, because they didn't. They did not speak the way the King James is written. But the King James is written that way so that it can follow the Greek and Hebrew, and you can follow the way that the words are being said, who they're being said to, who are they coming from, and what the intent of the words were. And those define that. It gives us a singular possession or a plural possession and little things like that. And uh, <clears throat> I'll make another video that kind of goes over that a little bit better. But they had a higher English to match Greek and Hebrew. It's always been said that Greek is a beautiful language and it allows you to robustly get across a point because it's so robust, but so is high English or the king's English as I would like to call it. There are so many valuable words in the King James to describe the situation. But for me, I prefer using the King James to study and preach from just because it's got such a depth and such a beauty to it. And I find that the study with the King James is higher than any other version. Let's, <clears throat> you say, well, Dave, there's so many hard words in this, and those archaic words, I don't know the meanings to. There's a fantastic resource out there for the King James version. And if you go to the website or search in your search bar, av1611.com, KJV Bible, it will take you to this other page over here. And this page has every word in the King James with the meaning of that word back at that time, between 1500s to the 16, 1700s. So if I want to find out what a word is, I click on the letter, this word, and I find it in a list, and it gives me a definition of it back then. One of the ones I really like to always show everybody is the word prevent. In the... In our language today, prevent means to stop somebody from doing something or to prevent it from being done. Back in this time, if I look up the word pre prevent, it means to pre-event. It means to come before. So there's a time in the Bible where Jesus says that he was going to prevent his, God, his disciples from going someplace. Well, it actually means he was going to do it before they got there. Pre-event, not prevent. So this is a very valuable resource whenever you're reading the King James Bible, to come over here and look up those words that don't immediately make sense to you. I would like to take, for example, this scripture here and look at it under a microscope and see how the different versions recount this verse. First, we'll look at it in the King James Version. It says, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. That's pretty straightforward. There are a couple of complicated words in there. Uh, prove, beseech, and pulse would be the first three that I see. But let's see how the New King James handles this. It says, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Sounds like a very valid translation. Let's go down to the NIV. Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. And finally, let's go down to the New Living Translation. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, said Daniel. I find this very interesting. The last one says, says Daniel. The script does not say, says Daniel at this point. The New Living Translation is an idea for idea translation. It's not word for word, where the, the New American Standard would be in the New King James, the King James would be more literal translations. The NIV and the uh, NLT would be more of an idea for idea translation. But words matter. So let's look at this and see what we can see on the different words here. 
First we have Prove Thy Servants. Now I'm going to go to AV 1611 and I'm going to look up the word prove because I want to know what that means. Prove means to try to ascertain some unknown quality or truth by an experiment or a test or a standard. Well, that makes pretty good sense. The guys are asking to give us a test, an experiment for over 10 days to see if we would do good on this different diet. So that fits pretty good, Prove does. The other versions translate prove as test or try. And that works too, doesn't it? Because here we have to try by a test or a standard. So we got a pretty good word for word translation here. So prove and test and try are equal. The next one says thy. Well, David says prove thy servants. Thy is a singular possessive. In other words, they are his servants. The Meltzer is put on charge of them. They are over him. He is asking the Meltzer, can I have poles instead of the king's meat to eat? Well, in the new translations, it says your, which is a plural possession, which means anybody that's over them. We're just begging anybody for, for this opportunity. This is more concise and points straight back to the Meltzer. Now you say, Dave, those are pretty little things. I don't know in the grand scheme of things that that really matters. And I can agree with you and say, you know, I could probably read those and, and be just as, just as well off if I didn't. Although I do see a little bit more uh, conciseness in the King James. So let's look at the next section here. And it says, I beseech thee. And that beseech is kind of an, an odd word, Dave. I, I don't know if I really understand beseech. So let's go back to our AV. 1611.com, and here we have beseech, to entreat, to supplicate, to implore, to ask and pray with urgency. What we're doing here is Daniel is begging the Meltzer for the opportunity to be tested in this area. So this word means to beg, to plead, to, to uh, pray and ask for with urgency. The other ones translated this as please. Now, when I hear this, I think of them politely asking their, their, their supervisor if they can do this. But there is a time when please does mean to beg. And I get it whenever my daughter, when she was little, wanted something so bad, and she would say, please, 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 please. So if there would have been please, please, oh, please, a row of those, that would mean the same thing as beseech. But just one please doesn't necessarily mean that. Now we have a difference between asking politely and begging with urgency. There's another tool out there called Strong's uh, Concordance, and you can pick those up anywhere. You can find one online for free. And every word in the Hebrew and Greek is listed there in the Bible. Here, the word that has been translated as beseech is Strong's Hebrew word for H4994. And that Hebrew word means in Hebrew to entreaty, to attempt to persuade someone to do something, to plea. So here we are backing up what the beseech means. It means to beg, to, to try to persuade him, to do it with urgency, not just a simple, please, can we do this? You say, Dave, that's, that's still just a little bit of a difference. But it is a little bit of a difference. It's a big difference. I beseech thee, a singular person, the thee on the end means a singular person, but the object, the one who's being, receiving the action. So I am begging thee, the Meltzer, begging his immediate supervisor. Let's take another step down here, and let's go to give us pulse to eat. Now, every translation except for the King James says it's vegetables. And I have to ask yourself, why would the Melzar or the steward or soldier or officer or whatever translation you have may change that to that? But in the King James, it denotes a proper name, a proper uh, name for that position. 
Why would the milter not want to have the boys eat a vegetarian diet? That's a good question, and I've asked myself that many times until I really studied this out. When I think of vegetarian diet, I think of all sorts of fantastic vegetables. I think of lettuce and cabbage and carrots and tomatoes. Well, those might be a fruit. But uh, <clears throat> all sorts of different things, beets and plums and uh, all sorts of fantastic things to eat. Why would the melter be so concerned with the boys eating this diet? Well, if I look up the word pulse in, at av1611.com, it says legumes plants or their seeds. The plants whose pericarp is a legume or a pod as a bean or a pea. Oh, well, here we go with another compli complicated word, pericarp. What does that mean? It means the fruit, the part that we would eat, the stuff that we like. The, the, the peach is a fruit. It's the pericarp, and it decide, there's, all three, there's three different pieces of that fruit. But its fruit is beans or peas or seeds. It's not the vegetables, but the seeds that the vegetables would come from. So that would be like me going to the store and buying a packet of burpee seeds and eating the seeds. Or pouring them into a bowl and making them into a mush. Or just getting gonzo beans and you put them in the water, let them soak up, and then you eat them. So that's what we're talking about here. They are eating beans or something we would probably call mush. It's just a, a bland mixture of, of nothing. It has no real nutritional value to it at all. And you say, well, this makes sense. If they were eating only mush, now we know why the Meltzer was so worried that he was going to lose his head because the boys would look sick and anemic. This is a miracle. God blessed Daniel and his compadres and not only blessed them, but made them more fat and more healthier than the other boys eating the best food in the nation. This is a miracle. By translating this as vegetable, we have done away with the miraculous event here. God did something miraculous here. He took boys eating mush and water and gave them a healthy and more fat and fit look than the other boys who were eating the best of the best that man could offer. This is truly a miracle. The reason the Melzer was so worried is because it would have been beans or seeds and not vegetables to eat. But how can we apply this to our life? What does this matter? Why, why do I care about this? Why do the little things matter? This is a good question. And this is the whole reason to study the Word. How do I apply this to my life? If you are serving God, circumstances don't matter. But Dave, I was born into uh, this lifestyle. I was born into this group of family. I was born here. I was born without, and, and I've been adopted. God doesn't, it doesn't matter where you come from. God can use you anywhere and do it in a miraculous way. But, but I'm not rich. I'm not a prince. I'm not a princess. I'm just a, a poor pauper. I'm just someone that has nothing. Position and class doesn't matter either. God can use you from wherever you come from. You don't have to be wealthy to be used by God. You don't have to be poor to be used by God either. God can use you just where you are. It doesn't matter your intelligence. That doesn't matter either. I think back to the scripture where it talks about the disciples after they were in Acts 2, when they, right after they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they came out and they were speaking in tongues and languages and the people were amazed. They said, how do these unlearned guys learn our language, but not just our language, but the exact dialect that we speak? You say, well, Dave, well, I don't understand what do you mean by dialect. Well, here in, in Kansas, we speak English. In Louisiana, they speak English, but they almost sound different because we use different accents and different drawls and different metaphors and different meanings. Just like if I were to go up to Minnesota, there would be a lot of different differences between our languages. A dialect is a regional accent. These men were actually speaking in everybody's regional accent, which was a fantastic miracle of God. 
God can do great things through you. It doesn't matter your circumstance. It doesn't matter your position in life. It doesn't even matter if you're smart. God can use you anywhere, anytime. God can do anything. What is impossible for man is possible for God. Thank you for your time, and please like and subscribe. Thank you very much.